so before we understand hearing system and down syndrome in specific uh let's have a normal an understanding of how the hearing system works it's, it's pretty straightforward really we have uh, the outer part of the ear uh, which we call uh, the outer ear uh, no surprises there uh, that's the pinna the part that you see here and a canal that goes deep inside towards the ear drum now when sound goes from the outer ear to the ear drum we have the ear drum that vibrates this is vibration because sound is a form of energy which causes vibration it's kind of a a uh, one particle hitting the other so that's a vibratory uh, signal now this vibration then passes on from the eardrum to something we call the middle ear which is a cavity which is air filled and is uh, uh, a set of three bones really one bone second bone and third bone they are uh, called malleus incus tapes also called the hammer and brillen and sort of other uh, colloquial names okay. and then it goes inside to the nerves uh, of uh, the ear called the inner ear the cochlea and from the cochlea sound will go to the brain after being converted to electricity now that's that's how the normal system works we have the outer ear which is collecting sound the middle ear which is in a way transmitting sound and amplifying it a little and the cochlea which is converting the sound uh, energy to the vibration to electrical impulses which will be up to the brain through the auditory nerve and the brain does its own hocus pocus trying to understand language and and make meaningful uh, 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 sense out of out of uh, the words that we hear and react accordingly now um let's focus on the outer ear first what's the outer ear the outer ear starts with the pinna the outer portion um, so let's say this is this is the outer ear this is uh, this is the pinna with this collecting sound and we have a cavity which connects to the eardrum that's that's the extent now you know the ear is an extension of the skin of the face so just as you have oily skin and dry skin on the face some people require to uh, to wash their face very often because there's too much oil some need to apply lotions likewise people's ear canals can have glands which secrete more oil or less oil it's a little different than regular oil on the face they call cere and so here which keep the ear lubricated the idea is that the ear should not be too dry so the skin is a little lubricated by the oil it secretes the ears have a cerement secreting glands that keep the ear canal lubricated now as your nails grow from uh, proximal to distal they grow from here and up 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 and grow out likewise the skin in the ear canal grows going from here and keeps progressing out like this like this like this would eventually dry out and fall out taking away that extra cerumen of wax which is there that's how our clean our ears clean our cells they this sort of there's an automatic mechanism about how your ears are going to clean themselves hence we say don't put a ear bud and everything in because you might just push wax deeper in it's already coming out automatically don't play around with it um so it's all natural but in cases when people may have narrow ear canals when people may have poor ciliary motion which the skin doesn't grow out or doesn't go out very well they can be hindrances so when the skin is going out and is mixed with with cerumen or wax it may just stick here and form a blob of a blob of debris obstructing the canal it is more common in children with down syndrome because about 50% of children born with down syndrome will have stenotic ear canals which means a narrower more tortuous ear canals will not be very wide thereby there will be a higher chance of these obstructions now what's the problem with the obstruction you might ask what what what's it going to do one uh, if it's too much it will cause a decline in one's hearing because sound will not be able to go from here and and bypass or go through here to reach the eardrum so that's that's a common thing but more importantly whenever a doctor uses an otoscope one of the torches that you've seen us carry the ear doctors they sort of put something in your ear and try to have a look deep inside whenever we have a look with the otoscope we will not be able to see what's going on with the ear drum here we will be clueless about what's happening and as we'll see subsequently it is important for for doctors to be aware of what's happening with the middle ear or the ear drum uh, with young people with down syndrome uh, hence it is important to have the canal cleared of wax very frequently just so they can have a deeper look in and also to prevent a likelihood of developing hearing loss two major points how do we do that now one 
you would go to your ear doctor or how regularly would you go now children who are born with stenotic ear canals be it down syndrome or otherwise anyone who has narrow ear canals should probably be go to should probably go to a doctor every 3 to 6 months to have the ears checked for ear wax generally children very young will have this problem more because one they are young anyway they by the ears are small uh, and two they are stenotic so as you grow older you you become bigger your ear canals becomes wider uh, and it's easier for wax to come out automatically when you are younger you are so young that you can't even communicate um to anyone that your ears are feeling jammed or blocked hence it is important for a regular check up 3 to 6 months for very stenotic canals every 3 months for not so stenotic maybe once in 6 months or a year that is something that your pediatrician slash your ear doctor will tell you whoever is your first point of contact with regards to your ear uh, generally ear doctors have more uh, experience and more uh, you can say tech to have a look inside the ear uh, with the otoscope or the small microscope um so that's it now once you are with a doctor and they see that the the ear is clogged with ear wax they might want to clear it out by either using something called a suction machine which basically means a vacuum cleaner a nozzle with a vacuum cleaner which they insert in the ear which sucks out everything that's there two they can also wash the ear but generally it's done for for older uh, people not for younger as much so they may put a small syringe and, and put some water in that kind of washes your ear out uh, and, uh, and this comes to again uh, the second point that a lot of people feel that you should not let water go in your ears uh, that's a small point about that if you think that your child or yourself yourself are more prone for having ear blockages because of wax it is a good idea to wash your ears from inside um, say from 100 years from now we did not have indoor plumbing the only way somebody could take a bath was to jump in a pond or a river or the ocean that's how you people would swim to take a bath and when you swim water goes in your ear and washes it out so for thousands of years even millions of years you could say from evolutionary point of view animals have been taking jumps in water to have their ears washed out and for the last 100 odd years we have showers and we have buckets and mugs indoor plumbing really and we feel that water entering the ear is a big no no but then how does your ear clean itself there's of course movement of the wax and cilia and skin out but if the water goes in it takes everything out with it and and makes it faster so do talk to your ear doctor if the ear is not very strictured and if they've cleaned the ear then every time you take a shower having a little bit of water going in the ear tilting index slightly by 15 degrees let some water go in and rinse it out if you swim very good uh, swimming automatically cleans the ear so so that's that's in a way a very very good idea um but if your ears are not clean if they already have a quantum of ear wax in them then washing your ear is a bad idea because then the wax and water will combine and may form a clump so the first point of course should be medical intervention and once the doctors have cleaned your ear after that you can ask their opinion you can occasionally put a drop of saline in the ear to make the wax a little softer and then wash it out or syringe it out or however Uh, can be done at home if you are competent. Otherwise, go to a doctor; they'll do it for you. But either way, it's safe. Really, it's not very unsafe to do it at home. Also, as long as uh, no sharp things are used and you don't, you're not poking something in the ear. As long as that's not happening, it's it's rather safe. It's quite all right. Right. So the younger children, of course, you go to a doctor. The older children will, uh, um, okay. The older children will need uh, uh, will not need this as much. But they can also tell you that the ears are feeling a little clogged uh, and. Uh, Uh, and perhaps it's 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 fully blocked and if the wax is too hard you may have to put uh, a oil kind of substance to dissolve it they they commercially available uh, ointments oils not ointments oil series which are uh, some commercial names i'm not promoting a brand here but but names like solivax wax sol clear wax the name itself tells you that that's a wax dissolving liquid so so no suspense there um so uh, what we have just seen to summarize is the normal function of the outer ear is to conduct sound in for which it needs the cavity needs to be cleared uh, we have uh, the potential medical concern because about 50% of children with down syndrome may have stenotic ear canals narrow uh, more more likely to get obstructed uh, the symptom will be probably none for younger children they'll not complain so we have to be proactive in trying to find out the concern for older children they may feel a ear block or something not quite right and uh, the diagnosis is by having a look inside through a otoscope or a microscope uh, office microscope 
the treatment is take the wax out and uh, future course to keep the ear clean because uh, that will make sure that just wash your ear will make sure that wax doesn't go in. Uh, how safe is it to wash your ear? Be to your doctor. If the ear canal is too stenotic, maybe not a good idea, but if it's a wider ear canal, it's a good idea, a good habit to wash your ears every time you take a head shot uh, or a head bath. Uh, that finishes the first section of the outer ear. Uh, Ms. Deepa, are there any questions? Anyone has any questions, guys, please um, ask with this, with regards to this. We can even take them in the end if, if there's none. Yeah, Yeah, that's, I don't think, um, yeah, doctor, you can proceed. I don't think we should can. carry on? Yeah, please. Thank you. Okay, Ji. perfect. Now, we're moving on to the other part of the ear called the middle ear, the part behind the eardrum, uh, which is... Uh, uh, primarily concerned with uh, with getting sound from the outside to the eardrum, which moves the three bones, which take it inside uh, to the cochlea. Now, the middle ear is an air-filled cavity. It, it's filled with air, uh, and the drum in between it's like a membrane, which is like a drum. If you if you if you think of a drum, there's an outside of a drum where you hit, and there's an inside of a drum that that you can't see, but that's the inside. So think it like that. Now, for the drum or the eardrum. To move well, the air pressure outside the eardrum, which means in this section here, and behind the eardrum, which is this section here, it should be equal. Uh, if the eardrum pressure here is too much, it'll just balloon it out, and a balloon doesn't play as as good as a as a uh, as a neutral drum. If the pressure here is too little, it's going to suck it in like a vacuum. Uh, in which case, also the eardrum will not vibrate very well to sound, um, and and to maintain that pressure equalization, we have atmospheric pressure outside. So this is the atmosphere and the air is going in here. So that's that's atmospheric. And to maintain the middle ear pressure, we have a small tube which connects the middle ear to the nose. It's called the eustachian tube. Uh, eustachian, E-U-S-T-A-C-H-I-A-N, eustachian tube. Um, so the problem is, for some reason, if the tube here, which is which is this tube, here. So if, if this tube blocks up, it, it's kind of has an obstruction here, in which case we will have vacuum in the middle ear. This vacuum will eventually pull the eardrum in. And to help with the vacuum, you might have these small mucus glands, the glands that secrete kind of a mucoid thing. For example, your mouth has the buccal cavity, the, the cavity has mucoid, mucus uh, layer. It, it secretes fluid, uh, which can secrete fluid and your ear can get uh, blocked up with fluid here. Now, why would this tube get blocked? Again, multiple reasons. If somebody has uh, a blockage in the nose, a respiratory tract infection, upper respiratory tract infection, so calm, uh, uh, runny nose, there can be fluid layer which blocks the which blocks the uh, uh, the eustachian tube. If you have any other mass effect like uh, and large adenoids, which are small glands at the back of the uh, back of the nose, uh, which can also cause blockage. Uh, but one more important reason is that children with Down syndrome can have uh, the shape of the nasopharynx, that, that this, this portion at the back of the nose, the shape is such that the eustachian tube doesn't open very much. So every time we swallow the saliva in, uh, one of the muscles in the palate moves in a way that it opens the eustachian tube and air equalization happens. The tube is not open all the time. It opens every time we swallow. Uh, but there could be some sort of tone imbalances, the muscle tone is a little lower, or the shape is such that the eustachian tube is more likely to be uh, obstructed more often than not, thereby making this region here prone to be filled with fluid, uh, something we call uh, otitis media. Now, this fluid is kind of like a gum. You don't know how the consistency of honey or gum is, uh, glue. So, so the, the term that is used is glue ear. Uh, glue ear is the term that they use for middle ear uh, fluid concerns. Now, what's what's the problem with that? Why why does that uh, bother us? Uh, now, the, the bother is that if we have glue ear, then uh, there'll be fluid behind the ear drum, and the drum will not move very much. Uh, so every time you are hearing something, this fluid here is making sure that it's kind of more resistant to movement. Uh, and less sound will pass on, thereby causing some degree of hearing loss uh, in, in people with glue ear. 
The other part is that if this is infected, this can also lead to all sorts of uh, painful ear conditions, uh, congestion of the eardrum, maybe eventually a rupture in some cases. Uh, let's take them one by one. So, so best case scenario is when you have a little bit of blue, but not bothering, uh, but causing a hearing loss to an extent. Now, the symptom of a hearing loss will be that the child will be less uh, attentive towards things around them. They are a little, it's like this, if I'm talking at that volume, I could probably snatch your attention and, and draw it towards me. But if I reduce my volume to this, then you'll have to strain a lot more. And if I keep on talking like this, after a few minutes, you'll give up. It's, it's too much effort to listen to this person. So a little bit of hearing loss has this potential to, to get you distracted more easily. Um, and distractions at a younger age more easily will mean that they will not learn uh, all the skills that younger children learn, language, uh, speech understanding, behavior, uh, all, all, all sort of things can go haywire. And therefore, it is important for, uh, for the ear to be checked frequently uh, by the ear doctors who can put a light here and see if the eardrum looks all right or the eardrum looks a little congested or full of fluid, retracted vacuum, uh, for which it is important that the ear canal be free of debris and ear wax. Otherwise, they'll not be able to have a look. Um, now, this is the best case scenario. Worst case scenario can be that the glue is infected and because it's infected, it causes a lot of congestion in the eardrum, pain in the eardrum, and the child starts crying with pain. They feel that, uh, I mean, they'll, they'll probably not tell you it's a earache. They'll probably just keep their hand on the ear and start crying. Um, children are smart. They would let you know that they're not comfortable if if in doubt, if you don't know what's going on, why are they so upset? Why are they crying consistently? By the touching their ear again and again, um, you need to go to an ear doctor for them to have a look, whether it's glue ear or not, um, and uh, uh, and have it sorted. So again, uh, for younger children, it's a good idea to have them checked regularly every three to six months. Uh, for children who who are more prone for respiratory tract infections. Uh, Three months is ideal or, or six months can also work if you think. I mean, you can go need-based really, but it's a good idea to sort of just, just be in the in a in a touch with a ear doctor who can make sure that none of this is happening. Because sometimes it can be something which is subclinical. They may not complain, but it might still be going on um, if it's if it's not infected. Now, uh, once a doctor has had a look, they will want to have something called a tympanometry test. A tympanometry test is when we put a probe in the ear, and that probe to, uh, to sending waves in the ear can check what is the pressure behind the eardrum uh, compared with atmospheric pressure. Now, atmospheric pressure is considered to be zero. That's the arbitrary term, so zero decapascal. So this, in this graph, you, you'll see probably, uh, probably this line here will be zero. Yeah, zero, this is zero, this line here. And the peak of the graph, the, the peak that's forming, the peak tells us what is the pressure of the ear. So is it near zero or not? Now in the red, in, in case of the red graph, uh, it's at minus 50. The, the blue one, which is the left ear, red is right, blue is left. That's again something arbitrary, uh, but a uniform code of right and left. The right side ear concerns are, are plotted in red color, left side is in blue color, right? So in this case, we see a peak forming, and if the peak is within the green bar, we are happy. This is a normal pressure range. It may not be at zero, some may be at minus 60, some may be at plus 40, but that's normal, that's all right. So this is a normal tympanogram. If you see something with, with two peaks which are in a green line near zero, that's very well. You may have a graph which looks like this, in, uh, okay. in which case we see that the left ear is a little negative. It's going be before, this is more negative, minus 400, minus 200 and so on. Uh, the left ear is not moving at all. The right ear is more towards the negative side. So that's kind of a, a, a glue ear in the making. It's kind of blocked already, but there's no fluid here, but there's a vacuum inside, and the vacuum is putting it in. So the the the, uh, the the pressure is negative pressure in the ear. And you can also have a graph like this, where the drum is not moving at all. That movement, that triangle, that, that peak you were seeing was movement of the eardrum. Yeah, the drum is not moving because it's filled, of, filled with water. And if the drum is not moving, we are likely to have a hearing loss. The child will not be hearing very well. So we have these graphs, which will tell us what's going on. Ideal is, uh, is this. Uh, this is 
problem either in the making or recovering and this is this is not good this is bad um, how do we treat these conditions what what do we do next you see the the problem with glue ear is not to do with the ear as much as with the nose because the tube is in the nose and hence the treatment of this condition is given through the nose we need to open up the the nasopharynx the station tube now in this chart here you see this picture this part this is the nose this is how airflow is this is back of the nose which you don't see which you can't see you think nose is only this much no this is just the beginning the nose is going all the way to the back of your throat that's how air goes in uh, so this is back of the throat and the back of the nose so this is the eustachian tube opening which is now connecting to the ear uh, to open this up we need to take sprays in the nose be it saline spray to wash everything out be it a steroidal spray be it things like uh, xylometazone which there's some kind of drugs which uh, reduce the the edema reduce the swelling in the nose by constricting the blood vessels uh, you have all heard uh, names such as otrovin or uh, nosy kind or, or drugs like these. Uh, this is xylometazoline drugs. They cause immediate relief by opening up the, the nose. But the problem is people can get addicted to these and if taken for a long time, the drug in itself becomes a problem. Hence, such drugs are not to be recommended over a five day, six day period. Uh, should not be self-medicated at all, even though they're available on the counter. Uh, you should not self-medicate. Um, so go to your doctor, they'll write drugs like nasal sprays, saline sprays, steroid sprays, some drugs to be taken, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, antihistaminics, they call them anti-allergy drugs, uh, which make sure that there's no congestion forming in the nose, no mucus forming, um, and things get better. Occasionally, there's a chance that no matter what drugs we give you, the, the fluid doesn't go off. There's, uh, there's still... Uh, there's still kind of fluid formed here and the drugs are not being able to open this. Now, what do we do then? Then we do a small surgery called uh, uh, a ventilation tube, a grommet insertion in the eardrum. That means that if you're not able to equalize the pressure from here, then we can put a small grommet in the eardrum surgically, which will make sure that the pressure will be equalized from the outside. So not from the inside, then from the outside. It's a common surgery, not very difficult to perform, doesn't take long. Um, so if the medical treatment fails, grommet surgery, grommet insertion, you know what grommets are? Uh, you've, you've seen those small buttons in your jeans that, you know, are par, which have a hole, those, those metallic small round rings, they're called grommets. Uh, uh, anywhere else, I mean, even purses, you have those small buckles with, uh, where you can take your buckles in. Those are called grommets. So, so likewise in the ear, we put the small tube like a grommet so it can go, pressure can equalize front and back. There are some precautions if you have grommets in your ear, then you can't let water go in your ear, you can't wash your ear at all, because then water will go from the ear down to the middle ear, which we don't want. Uh, there's certain other, other concerns with them. But if needed, a grommet is a good idea uh, to pressure equalize so that there's no risk of uh, hearing loss forming because of a glue ear, if the glue ear is not getting better with medication. That's section two. Now we've covered the normal function of the middle ear, uh, the potential medical concern, which is glue ear, uh, which can cause uh, hearing loss, infection, sometimes eardrum perforations, rarely, sometimes, but um, the child will, with glue ear, either will be asymptomatic, they may not have pain, but sometimes they do complain of congestion and pain and may start crying. Uh, some people may develop fever also if it's infected. Uh, diagnosis is on a test called the tympanometry, which is a simple test. We put a probe in the ear to check the ear pressure. That's about it. Um, it takes about two minutes to do, um, not a difficult test. And the treatment is in the form of medical management and may need surgery. Um, if you do not want glue ear to happen again and again, uh, we have to prevent upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, you can give, uh, uh, so some children may have poor immune status. Vitamin C is great. Uh, steam inhalation, nebulization, uh, saline sprays to wash the ears. So this, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, saline sprays in the uh, in the nose to to clear out everything. Um, they work well. And uh, if if people are taking steam inhalation, saline sprays regularly, vitamin C in general, um, it's likely that they will not have very many URTIs. Uh, and uh, uh, well, that's the section two part. Are there any concerns, any queries now? Um, 
Doctor, just one question on, you know, post-op precautions when you have, uh, when your child has had a grommet. So my daughter's had mm, grommet in six months. Uh, yes. But the, yes. uh, now one of the precautions, of course, is to not allow water to go in. Uh, but also because yes. of the low muscle tone, swimming is recommended, is a highly recommended activity. So, and obviously being yes. summers, she's going to the swimming pool. Uh, while I do try to take all precautions in terms of giving her earplugs or, you know, the swimming cap, as a kid, rebellious, she wants to get it off. And many times she, dumped, you know, dumps her head into the pool, right? So, uh, you know, which is a better devil in this situation to stop swimming or what can I do in this case? Because it is very difficult to ask a child to have that right. uh, earplug on. So uh, most grommets will automatically fall out in two to three months. Even if they don't fall out, even if they're in place, they can form a small membrane which can block it. What we can do is we can do a new tympanometry to check whether the grommet is patent still, is allowing air to go in, or the grommet is sealed off and fallen out. If the grommet is still in and patent, then water entry in the ear should be considered as a, it, it can cause bigger problems than, than, so swimming cap is not going to prevent uh, water entry. All it does is it lets water seep in slowly instead of with a, with a, uh, with a band. So right. uh, uh, ear plugs can be customized. We can take ear sizes and make customized ear plugs, which are more comfortable in the ear, uh, sit well. They can be multicolored, something that the kid enjoys. Their favorite color can be can be made. Uh, earplug can be made with this favorite uh, favorite color that they have. Uh, so those earplugs can cause uh, those specific swimming ear molds uh, can be a good idea if they're going swimming. But otherwise, with grommets in place that are patent, swimming should not be something that uh, should be avoided. That, one, it's not clear water. It's, it's chlorinated water. Chlorinated yeah. water in itself can cause inflammation when it reaches the middle ear, cause more problems. So, so I would not recommend. Uh, swimming without earplugs. And if you must swim without earplugs, make sure that the grommet is already sealed off. It generally takes a month, two months for the grommets to fall out. So if it's six months, I think it should be safe. But uh, having it tested might be a good idea. Okay, so my test is due then. Yep. Thank you, doctor. Uh, doctor one uh, question in the chat. Uh, how often should tympanometry be done? Should we wait for any signs and symptoms or regularly, only, timely yeah. check? So only when, your, only when your ear doctor checks your ear. Uh, so it's, it's not that you would go to tympanometry. So you see, tympanometry as a test is available uh, with some doctors. It's also available with uh, regular hearing clinics where we do not have trained people to have a look in the ear. Now, if somebody hasn't had a look in the ear, and the ear is blocked with wax or debris or ceremon, even then the tympanometry will show that the, the drum is not moving because for them, whatever the wax obstructing will be the drum. They, they don't know. So if somebody hasn't had a look in the ear to make sure that the canal is patent and the drum is visible, a tympanometry will only confuse you. Um, so when you go to your ear doctor and they have a look in the ear, they may then recommend a tympanometry. Now, since we already discussed that a regular checkup should be every three to six months, I think that will be the maximum number of times you'll be doing a tympanometry unless there's a problem identified and you're doing follow-up tests. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you sh should avoid going to a center to have a tympanometry done unless there's a qualified person there to have a look in the ear and suggest that, that the canal is patent. Uh, tympanometry is, can be done by audiologists who uh, some of them may know how to look in the ear, but, but as part of the training, a lot of them will not have a very uh, clear idea about about do that at least in this country um, and this is from experience so so there are some really good ones but there are also uh, some people who may not know and and by not knowing they are not being untrue to the profession for the kind of teaching we have in india they are not taught how to look in the ear and identify normal ear drums and bad ear drums that's not a part of the curriculum anyway so so go to your doctor let them advise whether tympanometry is needed or not um, Doctor, one more question. You said that grommets fall off in what, two to three months. Is that is that it? I mean, can are... fall off at any time between three to six. Okay, because normally. So generally, we say in six months, months, but it's. Uh, oh no, 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 six months is more than that. You've in your experience, it's eighteen months. That's what they say here. 
uh, in UK, they say it will it can take up to eight. It, they will fall off any time. Up, they can last up to eighteen months. Is the sentence used? They can last up. Haan, to, so that's the maximum this is. So, so maximum. Yeah. Haan, so then then both of us can be corrected this. Yes. So up to eighteen haan. months though. But you, in your experience, they. Are, but but generally we see it in two to three months. Oh, even my son had grommets when he was uh, when he was five, and we couldn't find the grommets after three months. So you see, your ear, ear drum is going to heal. That's it's a surgical procedure the in which they put a small slit. As the, huh, is it as the ear drum the heals, process? they're going to push the grommet out. So is it worth, because often the glue ear returns back once the grommet falls, isn't it? So there have been studies to tell or to find out how often uh, should you have the grommets in? Uh, do you need to have them again and again? Uh, and the study found that the grommet, uh, so in case of an acute condition, when you are out of options, when, when you don't know what else to do, you would put a grommet and you keep your fingers crossed and you reevaluate. If it comes back again and is again not getting treated by medication, you might still want to do a grommet thing again. Because you, we, are, we are choosing between two things. One is to live with the hearing loss. Mm. And second is to, to perform a surgery even for a short duration game mm -hmm. uh, and even the duration is short uh, but uh, it's helping with the hearing loss and helping with the development of the child uh, you would still do that uh, as the child grows older and the nasopharynx becomes bigger in size your adenoids reduce uh, your immunity becomes better you may not need the the glue surges again and again but for that duration till the time it's happening again and again you would not choose to live with a hearing loss you would still go out with the grommet and hope for the best. Cool, got it. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Just is there any downside of doing a grommet surgery repeatedly in terms of does it cause any uh, long term defect or uh, any effect on the eardrum yeah. itself? Yes, yes. So uh, if you're doing chronic grommet insertions, multiple grommet insertions in the same spot again and again, uh, or, and the ear is very small. Sort of uh, not a very large area, uh, so so chances are that the that the quadrant that they use to insert the grommet may repeat at the same place. Um, it can cause permanent uh, uh, perforation in the ear, uh, which may not heal uh, in theory. And uh, because of constantly putting grommets, uh, if water goes in the ear, you can have other infections. Uh, but having said that, we have to choose uh, between having the treatment done or living with a certain condition. Now, let's say if you are very aggressive in your uh, your precautions in terms of managing URTIs, upper respiratory tract infections, so calm, khasi, kuch bhi if you're sort of proactive in, in sorting that out with steam inhalation, uh, nasal medication, uh, antihistaminics, then the chances of uh, having a glue ear will be lesser. So you can be focused more on prevention and early treatment uh, and, and reduce the burden of grommets. But in certain cases, despite all efforts, if we are developing a glue ear again and again and again, which is causing a hearing loss, uh, we would still go with grommets, knowing fully that that these particular uh, conditions uh, may happen. And your operating surgeon will generally very honestly tell you that these are the pros and the cons, and you can weigh the thing uh, uh, with with whatever you feel is right, but but medical wisdom says that we don't want to live, or the child should not live with a hearing loss. That's what that's what medical wisdom is. Right. Thank okay. you. One more. Yeah. Question. Hi, doctor. My name is Sudhakaran. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, can I? Yeah. Please. Uh, sir, my baby uh, Shivani actually five point five years of old. Uh, so she actually uh, in the night uh, from the night after two o'clock uh, she uh, she's putting her head head up and down for continuously and we went to the ENT doctor and they said there is something in in inside the nose uh, so we they they have given some spray for using for three months so after that uh, she's just okay uh, so and uh, I don't know actually so they they are, they took the scan scan and all so they said something in it uh, in the ear in the nose the back side of the nose. Yes. So, so just yes. want to know what is the best treatment should I follow? And one more hospital, they so, said that actually they can check some endoscopy and they will put some tube into the nose and check how much percentage it is there or not. So I don't want to know yes. which is the best option to me. So what I'm, I'm, uh, so your question is a good question. 
However, since you have given a vague, uh, rough idea, I'll be. Uh, I think we are talking about adenoids. I think adenoid. Was your doctor yeah, right sleeping side. with the mouth right open? Side. Yeah, was right. Side. Was she snoring? Adenoid. Not snoring. Was she sleeping with the mouth open up. and snoring? And was it dribbling also? Or, or nothing. Nothing. The... Just just put her chin up and down continuously, falling down like that only. Chin so up in order to breathe better or chin up. Yeah, yeah, correct. Breathe to better. Breathe better. I feel like, to breathe yeah. better. Okay. Yeah, feel so better. So lying down, better, she yeah. was not breathing very well. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, it it's generally rare, but it could be sleep apnea also because if the tongue size is bigger and the face is smaller, the tongue could also be so. So that could also be a, a secondary thing. But if you think it's adenoids and if the sprays are helping, then it must be adenoids. So those sprays that they've given you are possibly steroid, uh, uh, nasal steroidal based sprays, which reduce the size of the adenoids. Uh, thereby, so adenoids are something which are uh, okay. Actually, I can I can show you here. So this is the nasopharynx, and uh, and and this is the part where the adenoids are. Yeah. Now, when you breathe in, air has to go from here, but the adenoids become bigger. Then they'll cause an obstruction in the in the air passage, and the child will have to open the mouth to breathe. And uh, now, one way is to do an X-ray from the side of the face called X-ray nasopharynx, in which they can see the 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 air cavity, how much is it there and how, what's the size of the adenoids. They can also do an endoscopy by putting a probe in the nose and checking how much is uh, the size of the adenoids. Some children may need adenoid removal surgically. Some may get better by using nasal sprays. Uh, as the child grows older and the nasopharynx in itself becomes bigger, uh, adenoids may not be a problem over time. But this, I, I think you're on the right track. But uh, and uh, uh, do sort of discuss with the doctors uh, if if uh, uh, they can repeat an X-ray after some time. We don't want too many X-rays, but but in case they might want after a certain uh, uh, number of days to see what is the reduction in the adenoid size there now and what's the cavity open. Uh, now the modern X-rays even tell you dimensions or percentage-wise what is the percentage of nasopharynx that's open. Uh, in a way that you can understand. They can say 50% obstruction or 60% obstruction or 20% obstruction. So a quantitative measure for you to know whether the treatment is helping or not. Uh, instead of relying solely on what they tell you, a quantitative measure is something that empowers you to, to decide whether, yes, this is helping or this is not helping. Um, so I, I think I think that's uh, uh, that's all right. But, but there are certain other things that can also cause uh, obstruction in, in, in breathing when you're sleeping, lying down, than when you get up. So those factors possibly have been ruled out in, in this case. Thank you so much, sir. My second doubt is actually maybe a little away. Uh, the, actually, she having Down syndrome, so she's afraid of sudden sounds like a mixer grinder, like a cook uh, voice or uh, fireworks. If sudden sounds are, she's getting very disturbed. Is that a normal sign? So can it want to do anything, check up or something like that? Please suggest. Uh, so, is it regularly there or not there? They're very varied presentations, and and being a community, I am sure that that many of you will have experiences which will vary from each other. So there's some element of commonality, but they, everyone has a different personality. Um, if she's older and she cannot tolerate loud sounds, we can do a test of loudness discomfort level to see what is the maximum sound she can tolerate, and is it normal or not. Then you can distinguish between a problem with the ear, there's some kind of hyperacusis in which loud sounds cause a problem, or is it more of a uh, a way she processes sound in which sudden sounds bother her. That's more to do with how you're reacting to sound than what the sound is doing to the ear. Uh, so uh, you're not reacting to loud sounds or not liking them is different from them causing pain in the ear because so hyperacusis and misophonia or, or, or loud sounds causing a concern can be checked. But personally, I don't think there's something that needs immediate medical intervention if it's not bothering her day-to-day -day activities. Uh, having said that, if you think it's a concern, there's simple tests that can be done uh, to distinguish between uh, hyperacusis or uh, discomfort with loud sounds and uh, ab aversion to loud sounds because they cause uh, an emotional response. So there's uh, the part of the, the brain that processes sound is called the auditory system, hearing system. And the part next to it is called the limbic system, which is the emotional system. I'll di I'm digressing a little here, but this is uh, something that you might find of interest. Lower animals have the hearing system and the emotional system, which are next to each other. There's the side of the brain called the temporal lobe. Both of them are there, very, very close to each other. Um, so somebody who has a, a, a rabbit, if, if they hear a sound, the first reaction would be to run away from the sound. Uh, 
they don't have higher cognition uh, to analyze it. Humans have higher cognition to analyze it, but that's a longer pathway. Example, you're going uh, home and somebody, a child behind the door says, Bow! the first reaction of you is you hear the sound and your heart comes to your mouth. And the next longer term reaction is that you realize, oh, this is just a child who's, who's my son or my daughter or someone who's just trying to scare me. So the emotional response is always faster than the rational response. Uh, if you're going in a car and a tire bursts, uh, not your car, but somebody else's car or something happens, the engine sound up, pat, the first thing is you get scared and a rational thought comes a few milliseconds later that this was this son. Younger children may take some time to develop these rational ideas. So the sudden sound may cause fear, but the rational part may take some time to come. And maybe she or he, they're developing that, that feature. And, and we are a little too observant in that and trying to find out what's going on. If we just give it some time, they'll be okay. That could also happen. It's that emotional responses to sound are always faster than rational responses. That's what is the crux of what I was trying to explain. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Doctor, there's one more question. Um, what steps can be taken yes, after swimming to avoid uh, accumulation of water in the middle ear? Water will not go in the middle ear if it's intact. Uh, so with the intact eardrum, water will only go till the eardrum and come out. And uh, uh, what steps you're taking, the first step you should take is don't try to take it out by using a earbud. Do not try to do any hanky-panky with the ear. Uh, trying to use something to take a don't don't give excuses that I only put the earbud only slightly in only half a half a millimeter don't do nothing if the ear canal is clear the water will automatically come out the children are generally active they're jumping around they'll move one side other side with gravity it'll come out it'll dry out even if it doesn't come out it'll evaporate so don't bother uh, about anything but if you have had grommets in the ear and water's gone in the ear then just hope that it doesn't cause uh, infection. Steam inhalation is a good idea, which clears the nasal pharynx. So anything in the middle ear can just wash out from the eustachian tube. Uh, uh, nasal sprays with saline, which will clear the eustachian tube again. Those factors. But but if your eardrum is intact, no concern. Nothing. There's no, no problem whatsoever. Thank you, doctor. That's all I think we have. Uh, okay. Hello, doctor. Just so, one uh, question here. Yes, please. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah so actually, I, our baby is the, uh, our baby is ten months old. So like uh, for the Down syndrome, maybe uh, uh, what the regular test we should do uh, at the time of birth, we did OAE and yes. that was fine for both years. Very good. So so at this is anything we should do because uh, nothing actually at this moment we are observing whatever impact or any sound we make, I uh, get we see the response. So, yes, perfect. Uh, nothing. So which is perfect. I, I think I think having an OE at birth is a great idea. It's universally done in the UK, as Dr. Sina will say. Uh, in India, we don't have a universal hearing screening program, but most good hospitals do it. Uh, you should just have a year's checked for accumulated ear wax. And if there's no ear wax or debris, then your ear doctor who looks in the ear can also vouch whether the eardrum looks healthy or not. And the eardrum looks healthy, regular follow-ups with your doctor, maybe three to six months. Uh, if there are no concerns every six months, if there are concerns every three months, and if there's, uh, you think that, uh, of course, when you check your hearing responses, generally people do it with only one type of sounds, like a clap or something, which are broadband sounds. If you want to test them, also test with high frequency. Low frequency are moti in heavy bass, baritone, low frequency. High frequency are uh, higher notes on the piano, the the extreme sides, the very high So like you have those uh, rattles, which are, Dum dum and rattles are chan chan. Check with all rattles, different tones, see how they're responding. Children enjoy, uh, children with down, down, uh, anyway, very fond of different sounds and music. Uh, so I, I think you're on the right track. Nothing substantial needs to be done other than just somebody having a look in the ear and checking if the eardrum looks healthy and fine and, and old school. That's it. Okay, I think few, uh, some people recommended Beira also, but uh, um, as of now, until now, someone told that uh, if there is some uh, you find any discrepancy or some issue, then only better should be done. So, is that correct? Yeah. So it depends on. Uh, so having a better done is not a bad idea. Just like me having an MRI done for my brain is not a bad idea. I can have an MRI. I may have something. Uh, but everything has to follow uh, a, a reason. So now, if there's your ear doctor feels that there's a reason to suspect a hearing loss, they will ask for a better. Indeed, definitely ask for a better. 
if they suspect that it's not needed and the OE has been done, they may not because children with Down syndrome very rarely will have sensory neural hearing losses as part of the, uh, uh, the what we see is that they don't have sensory neural hearing losses and the population is almost at birth at least is, is not very different from general population. If, if, if uh, a, a kid with, who does not have Down syndrome, if it's not going for a better otherwise, then your child may also not need it unless there's a red flag somewhere or they find a concern or, or they find that uh, the development, the the language, uh, uh, or the the awareness to sound is not coming. Uh, that may, but having said that, if you are, if you have a modicum of doubt that there might be something, also in subsequent mm -hmm. section. So that that's yeah, part of something we that can we really talk about. There first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all across the spectrum, but uh, if the child is. If your pediatrician does not feel the need or your, your ear doctor does not feel the need, you may not. It's not compulsory. Uh, it's something that you can have. Uh, if you haven't done, no, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but even if you don't at this point in time, uh, it's again, it's all right. So we look for red flags before we go for more tests. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now what we have discussed so far, is uh, the outer and the middle ear. Now, but you can also have a uh, normally functioning uh, outer ear, which uh, is, is clean and giving sound. Then you can have normally functioning middle ear with nothing wrong. And so it tympanometry is fine, but you can have the inner ear, which has these hair cells, which convert sound into electricity, which may not be working well. Uh, if there's a problem of this nature, we call it a sensory neural hearing loss. Sensory as cochlear, neural as a nerve, sensory neural hearing loss. Um, in the past, it was believed that children, 2% of children with Down syndrome uh, will, will I mean, much higher figure was given, but then it eventually come, turned down that, that uh, a lot of children with Down syndrome may develop sensory neural hearing loss if they've had uncorrected glue ear, which leads to infected uh, uh, middle ear, and the infection can lead to toxins, which can then pass from here from here inside causing damage. But now since most blue ears are picked up in time, they don't progress to chronic ear problems or infected ear problems. Um, and this, the incidence of neural hearing loss is maybe, it's, it's low, I mean, it's, it's uh, less than 2%, I think. The 2% is still a high number, it's not a, a small number. But, but this can probably develop subsequently instead of having at the same time. Um, and this gets us to our next section, how do we check for hearing loss? Uh, in children uh, with Down syndrome. Uh, now, there are two ways to check for hearing loss. One is called an audiometry test or a pure audiometry test. Uh, in this test, we have a two room setup. We have someone who's testing. Now this person is testing and this person is having himself tested behind a soundproof barricade on the other side of the room. Uh, the tester will give sounds to listen to will we'll tell the person to listen to certain tones. Every time the, the, the listener hears a tone, they'll press a button or raise the hand or do something of that nature. Now, for younger children, we do behavioral tests in which we teach them when you hear a sound, maybe pass a block to the parent or, or throw a, a stuffed toy in a basket or uh, you know, uh, they can be something called a VRA testing in which Every time they, they hear a sound. Now we can do this test also on speakers. Now behind this person, there's a set of speakers uh, and we can do through speakers also, if not through headphones. But generally, uh, children above the age of four and a half, five years old can do this test if conditioned at home uh, before they come to a test environment that they have to respond to sound. Uh, with a plate, uh, a spoon on a plate and you raise your hand, uh, a rattle and you raise your hand and so on. So when they come to a clinic, we can do precise testing on various frequencies to know what is the hearing level uh, in all all hearing. Now, children who are younger, uh, who are uh, younger will need a bearer. Now, this is a bearer test room. This is uh, the other clinic. It just shows a setup in which we have a bearer machine, a laptop, and a couch where the child would lie down in a soundproof environment. This is all acoustically treated. This is the other clinic that we have. We were doing this bearer just two days back, so I took a picture. Uh, this person is having himself tested. Now, he has electrodes. Now, how, do a, how does a bearer work, let's say? For an audiogram to work, for a regular hearing test in which you raise your hand, uh, you give sound, which is going from here, 
hitting the eardrum, passing the middle ear, going to the cochlea, going to the nerve, going to the brain. And when the person hears in the brain, they say, ya sunliya, and they respond. So only older people can do it, five years and above. For younger people, they may not be able to have uh, this level of uh, a compliance. And so what we do is, okay, I probably need to delete all this markers that I've put, which I, which I can't seem to do. Uh, we'll just use this otherwise. Um, right. Hmm, interesting, it seems to be stuck. So, yeah, let's see. So in Bera, we give sound from the outer ear through a headphone, and we have electrodes at the back of the ear, which will pick up the current that's going from the nerve in the electrode. And we will be able to see if we're giving sound from the outside, how much of it is going to the inside nerve and we pick it up. So children as young as three day old, five day old, 10 day old can have the hearing checked. If we do a Bera, which stands for brainstem, evoked response audiometry. It's a type of audiometry in which instead of having uh, responses given to us subjectively by the person, we are taking objective responses uh, by recording electrical activity in the nerve uh, on the way when it's going to the brainstem. So brainstem evoked response audiometry, a part of the nerve which is in the brainstem is we record the electrical impulses and we know what's the hearing level. Can be done for younger children or children who are not compliant. The only bit is that there's a whole lot of electrical impulse that's going from the body to the brain. Uh, if I'm hearing the, the ears are sensing something, when I'm touching something, sensation from my hand is going to the brain. Uh, when I'm uh, wearing, whatever I'm doing, I'm moving my neck, muscle tones, uh, which can cause a lot of electrical noise. How does the electrode know whether this electricity is picking up is to the nerve of the ear or it's from everywhere else? Uh, so for that, we need to have the child as calm as possible, uh, idly sleeping. So if the child is sleeping, then we put electrodes and we give better responses, I mean, sound responses, and we check how much are they able to hear uh, in response to uh, uh, in response to what signal we are giving, and we plot it on a graph uh, called a Bera or a SSR report, uh, in which we can reasonably accurately tell if somebody has a hearing loss or not. Now the OAE test that was done will only be checking sound till the okay, sorry, till the Cochlea. Now, OE is basically you put a probe in the ear, it is sending sound signal. There are small nerve cells or hair cells in the in the cochlea, which then move up and down in response to sound. And that vibration sound is picked up by the machine again. So if the OAE is passed, we know that auto acoustic emission, part of neonatal hearing screening. We know that the pathway here is okay, the pathway here is okay, and this is okay. All this is okay if the OAE is passed. Bera over and above will tell us if the nerve Sorry, is the nerve conduction okay or not? So that's what the bearer will tell us over and above what OE is telling us. And we'll plot the levels on a graph such as this, uh, in which we have uh, on one axis, we have the uh, uh, the frequencies. Uh, so it's like keys of a piano. A uh, piano on the left has, has low frequency sound and high, high, high. So we're gonna check what's the child's hearing or adult's hearing at each frequency plot it in response to loudness of sound. Uh, now generally, uh, generally speech is between 30 and 50. So if I'm saying uh, something, uh, I'm saying I, I is at about 50 dB, uh, sirs are about 30 dB. So a child who has hearing level within 0 and 20 has normal hearing. A graph that comes between 30 and 40 is mild hearing loss. Something that comes in 50, 60, 70 is a moderate hearing loss. Something which goes below is severe and profound. Uh, this is how we will interpret a report for a ASSR, BERA ASSR, or uh, an audiometry. Difference between a BERA and ASSR, I keep on saying ASSR. BERA is brainstem evoked audiometry response, which is done for on, on a subjective kind of thing in which we get graphs which a technician or a clinician will have to interpret. ASSR is a better form called auditory steady state response in which we automatically get a plotted audiogram by giving the same frequencies to a better recording through, through electro, we get a plotted audiogram, which is a, a system generated thing, which is easier for, for parents to understand and clinicians to interpret. So do both, Bera, ASSR, both can be done if there's a risk factor. One, this is a, a report of uh, an audiogram uh, in which we see that uh, the right ear is between 30 and 40, so it's a mild hearing loss. The left ear is between 50 and 60, so it's a moderate hearing loss. One more thing that we have checked here 
is something called uh, bone conduction hearing loss now ah how do i get these uh, white things off let me let me check uh, wait let me uh, go back to another picture where i can probably draw it all over again here perhaps okay now <laughs> i seem to have made a uh, made a good mess anyway so when we're giving sound we can give sound from the ear here in which sound will have to go from the eardrum, middle ear, and inner ear. Uh, and we'll get a line, but we'll not know if the child is not hearing. We'll not know whether it's a problem with the eardrum, uh, canal here, middle ear, or inner ear. Second thing is we can give sound at the back of the ear by vibrating the bone here, back of the ear here. And when we make a vibration of the bone, sounds go directly from here to the inner ear. So somebody with a problem in the outer or middle ear, be it blue ear, be it obstruction, will have poor audiogram when we give sound from outside. One will have a great audiogram when we give sound from the back. They'll hear everything perfectly when we give sound from the bone conduction. Uh, and so every time we look at an audiogram, we see two uh, two graphs on each ear. We have uh, uh, the lower graph, which is mild hearing loss, but we also have the upper graph, these small four points, which are between 0 and 10. That's the bone conduction hearing. That tells us that child has a problem with outer or middle ear. The nerves are perfect. And if you take nasal space and clean the ear, everything will be fine. Likewise, in this year also, they have air conduction poor, but bone conduction is excellently done. Uh, so this child has a, a temporary hearing loss, which is conductive, uh, which will take care of itself uh, uh, with medication or over time as we go. Um, so in a year, I haven't dealt in too much detail because chances are that you will probably not have a lot of problems with this. Uh, but we have to be mindful of the red flags if the child is not responding to sound, if the OA at birth was uh, failed, was not passed, uh, if the child is not responding to sound as much as they should, if the uh, if there's a glue ear and the child cannot have an audiogram done because they're not uh, compliant enough or, or not able to understand instructions to that extent, then uh, we'll do a BERA to find out whether there's uh, a hearing loss. A BERA can also be done through sounds giving in the outer ear. Also at the back of the ear, uh, through uh, a bone conduction uh, uh, probe, which will tell us whether it's a temporary conductive hearing loss with the outer middle ear, or it's a more neural hearing loss, uh, which will require use of hearing aids or cochlear implants, um, which is something which is a broad topic in itself, and we should not worry about that because a vast majority will not be needing uh, these things. But if unfortunately someone does have a sensory neural hearing loss, then medication is not treated going to cure it, you will need to have uh, a hearing aid installed or a cochlear implant. Uh, that's section three. Uh, any concerns with this? Uh, uh, any queries that you might have? There are a few questions in the chat, Doctor. I'm just going to read them. Yes, uh, please. My son has dry visible ear backs and his outer ear is also very dry. I generally massage or clean with a drop of coconut oil. Is, this, is it safe to pour a drop of coconut oil inside the ear? If yes, how often can this be done? Uh, very subjective. So coconut oil is okay, but after you dissolve the wax with oil, you will need to have it taken out also. Uh, it's not. It's not going to. Oil is not going to take it out. It's not going to make it a little soluble and not hard enough to to poke the ear. Uh, if you use oil and then you wash your ear, your chances are that wax will come out. But in this case, I would advise to go to a ear doctor to have it checked. Number one, uh, the oil we recommend is generally. Uh, almond oil or uh, or uh, walnut oil uh, or olive oil because they're lighter oils and which will be absorbed by the canal skin easily. Coconut oil may be a little thicker and in itself may cause some temporary blockage in the ear if it forms a film um, and it will take some time for the oil to be absorbed by the, by the skin. But again, uh, we also do this because these concepts have come from the West uh, where, where uh, olive oil was more popular. Uh, um, in our uh, households, people say mustard oil. We generally don't promote it very much, but if you have been doing it and you think it's safe and your child enjoys that and doesn't have a problem, you can carry on. Medical wisdom generally says thinner oils, not very thick oils like almond oil or olive oil. Thank you, doctor. The other question is, what uh, t preventive tests can be done to check everything is on track for a three-year-old? Um, ear examination, uh, tympanometry. Uh, if you suspect uh, anything wrong, then a better. Thank you, doctor. 
Okay. I said, my baby, okay. Oh, no, sir. Yes, yeah, my baby is three years and three months old. We did bear at yes. the right ear. They say that uh, there is more mild hearing loss. Maybe yes. it's due to narrow canal or uh, wax or something like that. So if you, if you do a bearer, I'm sorry to cut you short. If you do a bearer, also do a tympanometry. If the tympanometry is normal and the bearer is not, then the chances are that the middle ear is not a problem. Do both. Oh. But did, okay. you, did you do both? Did you do both? Tympan yeah. bearer both or only a bearer? Yeah, we did the both. But the, the middle ear, they say that the what, uh, the fluid is there, something like that, you see. Ah, so if fluid is there and better is showing hearing loss, then chances are when the fluid will go away, uh, the hearing will improve. So it's a temporary, uh, a conductive hearing loss. Uh, and you will take medicines for the fluid, uh, for the for the middle ear, blue ear, uh, and maybe repeat the better again uh, after some time to see if the hearing has come back to normal. Yeah, the doctor is telling that uh, either they are asking to us, uh, shall I do eardrum, make a hole and remove the uh, this one? Fluid. Or this is not something that you discuss uh, more like you come to a conclusion based on evidence. So if the medicines are not working, if despite giving medicines, the tympanometry is not improving, uh, the drum is not moving at all, uh, despite everything you have done, then grommet insertion may be required. But if you have not taken a, a full course of medication yet and there's still some time, then you take the medicines and repeat a tympanometry report to see if the drum starts moving again. Okay. If that doesn't happen, then a grommet is, is required. Okay. If we do the, the something like that, the water again will go or uh, we don't know, the hole will we become don't know. closed? We, okay. We don't okay. know. Have okay. to be seen. Hello, doctor. Yes. Yeah, yes. Actually, when my son was two years old, uh, we have taken a uh, bera and OAE and everything is fine. Uh, everything is okay. Yes. And they asked us yes. to do the solivax, like if maybe the wax shouldn't be accumulated. So they told me to yes. use solivax often. Uh, yes. So how often we can use? Like now he's three years old and I'm going to take again tympanometry and bera as you suggested. So this solivax, like how often we can use and the, what is the impact it can create on the child? If you have, how it is? So, you see, I'll, I'll come to it again. If you have oily skin, your ears will have enough oil in themselves. So, solivax may not be needed as much. If you have dry skin, uh, then the ears will also be dry and solivax will be needed more. What is solivax doing is it is dissolving the wax in a way that when water goes in the ear, it will get the wax out. It will clear it out. Uh, if regularly you're washing the ears, then chances are the wax will not form. Daily basis, your debris will be cleaned, right? Uh, if you haven't washed your ears for a long time, then, and if the wax is there, then when you put solivax, that is a time when you'll have to go professionally to have it cleaned out. But if they have professionally cleaned it out, everything was normal, then maybe once in one drop in two, three days is more than enough, I would think. Children have narrow ear canals anyway, so there's, uh, if you put a lot of solivax, then when you sleep, it can soil the clothes, it can fall out, it can stain your pillows and all that. So uh, reasonably a drop, maybe once in two weeks, or once in two days, once in three days should be adequate. Okay, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. So all these things are, uh, uh, by the way, we are talking about uh, uh, in theory, but but how is it to be in practice? It depends on the, the width of the ear canal, the size and everything. All those factors can differ from child to child. Just one second. Bye. <laughs> My children. Come with me. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I think, Doctor, there are two more questions if you have yes, time. Please. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I have yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have. Okay, yeah, go sorry. On. Yeah, go on. That's fine. Go on. We had done a beta when my daughter was three months old and showed yes. a 5% hearing loss in one year, but the yes. other year was and was compensated. We had gone for a yearly uh, year checkup and doctor had not advised another beta. Her hearing is very acute. She hears quiet, soft sounds too. Is there any need to repeat a beta? No. No need. So 5% hearing loss. You are, see, beta as a test is getting out electrical impulses of the ear from a lot of electricity. Which means if my audiogram shows normal hearing, beta may show mild hearing loss. It is possible uh, that that when I when we do a better and I get a mild hearing loss, our audiogram report is 10 to 20 dB better. It is not unheard of. 
So all these things have to be taken in the whole stack. We're not here to treat a report. We are here to treat an individual. And if the individual shows no reason uh, or no no requirement of for treatment, they're doing as well as we expect them to do. Then we can ignore these minor aberrations here and there. Uh, but having said that, uh, sometimes the the parents are more concerned, uh, and and uh, if if this there's something that is causing you stress, anxiety, uh, that we haven't checked that this might be going on, then sometimes you can do a test just to rule out everything else. I mean, a lot of times we advise tests not because we think they're important, but because we think that that the parents need an evidence that everything is okay for them to feel more relaxed, and so it is for them that, that we ask them that you can have test that. So, so uh, these tests are not toxic, they're not invasive, uh, they don't uh, require uh, uh, anything uh, to be inserted in the, uh, no syringe, no injection, no pain, painless test, you just have, I just have to sleep and we do it, uh, just a few thousand rupees. Uh, so if it's something that you want to have done, by all means go for it, there's no, nothing, no, nothing wrong with it. Uh, but uh, it will not be something that we will push you for, but if you want to have it done, or if there's even a little bit of doubt in the head, might as well have it done and rule it out. Um, doctor, many a times I've heard in the group that uh, because children can't be calm, so obviously Vera gets difficult, so they are offered sedation. And many yes. a times children don't necessarily have any concerns, but Vera is done regularly, uh, you know, and done under sedation. Okay. Is that even recommended? Okay. You, what would you be your say? So it depends on if your doctor's Following a certain protocol, they are. You see, we don't have set guidelines in this country. There are guidance in uh, in the West, in which uh, they say that a recommended checkup is every three months or every six months uh, for younger children. A hearing screen might be done every year, uh, which is uh, which is all well. Uh, now, in India, there are two set of doctors. One who still are a little conservative, try to avoid testing if they can, if they don't see a need. And the other set is where they want everything to be as perfect as as uh, the Western literature recommends them, which ultimately leads to good record keeping. It, it it gives more confidence to doctors that everything is right, but also raises the medical healthcare expense. Uh, so the same medical healthcare, which was uh, a little more uh, cheaper uh, many years down the line, because doctors would not do tests based on their discretion are now more and more uh, favoring the West uh, or, or which is and unethical. I'm not saying this is not ethical. I'm just saying it's ethical, but the, the, how how your practice medicine is different. Uh, and uh, uh, having a regular bearer is no problem. The sedation that is generally given is oral sedation. They generally don't anesthetize you. Uh, help to uh, augment natural sleep, uh, which are considered safe. There's nothing wrong with those drugs also taken once a year. So as far as the safety profile is concerned, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. As far as uh, the need is concerned, uh, you can have a divided house there with what sort of uh, uh, what sort of concerns that a doctor expect there to be, what sort of concerns do the, chip, the parents feel are there. Uh, but in my experience, the child is doing all right in all spheres and the milestones are okay. Uh, uh, then tympanometries are fine then a bearer may not be needed because we are doing a bearer primarily to check if there's a hearing loss uh, of a glue year, nature of glue year. And if the glue year can be diagnosed with a tympanogram and you think there's no glue year, then bearer should also be normal. Why would the bearer be bad? Uh, and if there's a glue year and, and we want to know and it's not getting treated with medication, it's, it's and we then need to know whether there's a conductive hearing loss and do we need to insert grommets or not insert grommets? Then a bearer is a must. Because that's what's going to be the point whether we need to do surgical intervention or not. Uh, so everything has a role, but but you can take a step ladder approach. Uh, and uh, I mean, I would think if the timp is fine, then then there's very little chance for a bearer to be wrong. Uh, but that's my personal thing. But again, having said that, you may follow a protocol which says otherwise. Uh, so it's best if you, you discuss this out with your treating doctor. Uh, I'm just sitting on the other side of a screen here, and uh, and this, I mean, practically your doctor should tell you what you should do. This is only to gain more information so you can take informed decisions. You can have 
uh, very frank discussions with your doctor about the need of certain things or not need of certain things and come to a conclusion. Uh, I would, you should not take this conversation as a point of whether to go for a test or not. Just to, just no, to be more informed about absolutely. what to discuss yeah. with your yeah. doctors and, and find a way. No, no, absolutely. I was just asking this on behalf of the group because we have had these discussions where parents yeah, have, yeah, yeah. because sure. in UK, sure. they don't re really recommend Bera. Uh, on you know every year or regularly because they do it once OE is fine. So, but I was in the UK. I know that I I was at the Great Ormond Street Hospital. I know that the better dates were not very easily available either. So mm. so that so the UK model will also be because if they recommend very frequently, then the dates will get more and more pushed. In this country, a better is only about two three thousand rupees off. So so therefore people are it's like the MRIs. I mean, how many people have the MRI in the UK versus how many have in India? If you compare. India has far more number of people having the MRI than people in the UK would ever have it because of availability and because of which will also change how doctors would view these things. Right? If it's easily available and even if it helps in 10% more uh, 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 confirmation of what's going on, they may recommend. But I mean, I, I see your point. UK doesn't, UK has always been very conservative with testing. Yeah, they do uh, the hearing as, test, Because the NHS is. Yeah. Yeah, but they do the behavioral yeah. uh, hearing tests very regularly. More right? behavioral, yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much. And there are, sorry, a couple more questions. Uh, Deepa, you want to read them? Why are you apologizing for this? <laughs> we are here for this. Thank you, thank you. Really <laughs> appreciate you giving us the time. Yeah, please. Deepa. Sorry. Okay. Please carry on. You were asking something. Yeah, so I'm just going to read a question. My daughter is 10 years old. I did better at the age of six. The report is normal. Should I repeat the same test every year for her age? Um, I suppose you've just answered. Yeah, we've answered this. I, yeah. I think this was written before we, we were yes. on. We've answered this. Yeah. Uh, my baby is five years old. We did the OA, OAE test and the result has passed and the tympanometry results got AS. Is that okay? We tried better, but she woke up between. It failed. Please suggest. So you know what what AS means. Uh, it's <laughs> it's a good it's a good uh, thing that you've raised. So uh, I'm I'm going back to the tympanogram uh, picture that I had shown. Um, you see, when the graph that you see here is up all the way, very tall, it's called A. Tall is A. If the graph is shorter, which is which is the pressure is perfect, but it is not moving all this while, it's called AS. Now, if somebody has a obstructed middle ear bone, adults sometimes have uh, the middle ear bones which are uh, which fuse, which kind of the the uh, the bones here would uh, would fuse, and so the drum will not move very much, and so they will have normal pressure, but but it will be called AS because it's not moving as much. Uh, in adults, we will call it AS. You know, the problem is when they put these tympanogram probes inside, it's a child. The child has very small ear, very small drum. It will not move much. So when you look at a child and, the, and you see the drum is not moving as much, you will not call it AS. You will call it A, even if it's shorter than that thing because it's it's a small ear drum. The drum is it's like this. If I have a big balloon and I blow it, the balloon is blowing this much. If I have a big balloon which is strictured, the rubber is is not rubber has become hardened. It will blow this much. Uh, and I'll say this balloon is not blowing very much. But if I have a small balloon. It is only going to blow this much. I'm not going to say the balloon is faulty. That is what the balloon is going to blow. Likewise, a small ear drum is going to move less. So what you have is an A-type curve. But because the person who interpreted it was comparing adult level uh, 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 rationality to it, called it AS. Otherwise, it's an A-type curve. Young children, anyone under five, six year old will have a small curve. They will not have a large, big curve because the drum is not moving as much. So that's probably A. You can again confirm with your doctor whether it's an AS or because it's a small eardrum, maybe it's 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 anyway small. And uh, and normal temp is fine. I I think it's okay. Nothing to worry really. Thank you. My baby is four years old. We are advised for Bera test. Got to know from somewhere that <clears throat> Bera test can reveal which sounds will uh, not be able to produce by the child. I mean, child cannot produce certain sounds. That will be found out on no. Bera. No. no. I don't know if no. this info is reliable or not. Please guide. So what you are what you are saying is that what we can say to the Bera is what sounds the child can't hear. 
Now, if you put it to extension, if I can't hear a certain sound, I'll probably not be able to speak those sounds also because my biomechanism will not work. A lot of children perceive with hearing losses, if they have a hearing loss for sounds like sir or sure, which is most of hearing loss, even with hearing aids, sir, sure is not amplified. When you talk to them, you will know that they will not be able to say sir, sure, correct. If you, in your mind, if you have had conversations with children or people who are hearing impaired using hearing aids, you'll see that the speech deficit they'll have will be certain sounds which they haven't heard as a child. So on the way, indirectly they can, but but putting it directly like, it is not directly proportional. It, it is not that if you don't, Bera is not going to tell you what sounds you can't produce. No, no, that's that's not, that's stretching it a bit. Even though there is some modicum of thing, if I dive into it and I want to find a, a pearl of logic to bring to the surface and say, this is the logic, that's why I'm saying that, I can. But on a broader sense, a Bera is not going to tell what sounds a child is not going to produce. There are different pathways. Uh, not being able to produce sounds is all together to do with certain other things. It's not only those sounds that you can't hear, you can't produce. There's also how the vocalization is, how the vocal cords are, how much uh, speech the child is uh, being stimulated with at home. If the child is always on the screen, then they will not speak very fast. They'll not speak early. If the child is more with community socializing, they'll speak faster. Uh, so so that, that better thing is, I think, uh, I'm not very... Uh, it's not bang on. It, it's something which is a little vagueish and best. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions? Oh yes, there is one more. Sorry. Yeah, I, you always apologize. So, you know, thank you. Sorry, please. It's like in, when you live in UK, you just say <laughs> randomly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh. I think that's all I can't see anything yeah so okay so the last part which I wanted to cover uh, which is very short uh, use of headphones and uh, just to hearing uh, so as children grow older they will enjoy their music more and more and uh, at one point in time they will go to their headphones and start listening uh, and then the parents wonder if headphones are a good idea or a bad idea now one thing headphones will be good Earphones, if they stricture or, or, or stenotic ear canals will not fit very well, but if they do, that's also fine. Um, anything that they use should have some amount of noise cancellation. If your headphones are noise cancelling headphones, you will keep the general volume lower. If they do not have noise cancellation, then they tend to keep it louder to drown outside sound. Uh, so if I'm sitting in a very quiet area and I want to listen at 40 dB, I listen at 40. If I'm sitting at a noisy area where the level already is 40, 45, then I'll hear it at 80 just to get that feeling of 40. Which Dr. Seema will tell you that when you go in the tube, uh, you make the volume go up because uh, people who go in metro or tube or, or public transport, it's noisy. You, you make your headphone volume go up because you want to drown out that sound. So anything with noise cancellation will be better. Two, you should monitor the, uh, the headphone level in certain phones and Apple devices. Uh, you can go to the health tab on the health tab, you can check hearing and you can check what is the input of sound. If it's less than 80 dB uh, input, that's perfect. The child is perfectly safe with those headphone, earphone usage, and they should enjoy their music and, and be happy. Uh, if they're going beyond that, it's a problem. So if some doctors tell you no headphones, no earphones, that's not true. At what level you use them is the determining factor. You can check the level on the phone applications. A lot of them will tell you what is the uh, input volume to the ear. And, and be safe and, and let children enjoy hearing and enjoy music and, and just be happy as they are. That's all. Um, that's all from me. And uh, is there anything else that that needs discussion? Um, any any questions, guys? Yeah, doctor. Yeah, this is Deepa. Just on the sedation bit with respect to hearing, because a lot of time as parents, we are apprehensive of giving sedation. Our children already yes. go through such we don't want yes. to give sedation. Would you recommend, uh, like in, in, in my daughter's case, I've luckily have managed to avoid all sedation by just tiring her out, maybe giving her a nice Perfect. bath. Perfect. Putting so so let, me, let me tell you the instructions we give before you come to a bearer. Uh, the ideally, we ask the parents to make sure the child is, has not slept for a long time. So one thing is to call the, the child during the natural sleep time. If somebody says the child is naturally sleepy between this and this hour, we say this is the best time for a bearer. 
the night before they should sleep really late the morning uh, of the barrel they should wake up really early they should be tired they should shampoo their hair because we need to put electrodes and we don't want a film of oil uh, which to pay loose casual little loose uh, comfortable clothing because we need to access back of the ear uh, for electrodes and all that uh, and if we can do it in natural sleep that is the best way uh, you mentioned you gave her a nice bath you tied her out what are the other things that you did to 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 uh, enable natural sleep better i would take her to sleep uh, to play uh, in the morning and then tire her out for a nice hot water bath in the bathtub and uh, take her for a ride in the car so take her for a long ride before i reach the uh, you know the hearing center so that then she naturally falls asleep man and can i ask you how do you how do you make sure she doesn't sleep in the car that is one thing that everyone needs to know uh maybe play uh, play mu no but in her case i would make her sleep in the car itself so that she would oh. you know just reaches but take a longer ride because i'm 10 minutes from the center but i would take a long uh. an hour earlier so that she naturally falls asleep just a little before we come to the center because okay. in the okay. center her to sleep I so just five ten before she fall asleep and then it's easier to do the bera and we've done bera i think three times and we have been successful on days we have not been able to get her to sleep we had to take a reappointment and come back you know in a days time or two but right. we have been successfully able to evade the uh, the uh, so what do you call it so that's that's very thoughtful of you because that that's a that's a great strategy we do we do hope more parents can do this uh, sometimes in the so we have had children who have slept and come and we may able to do bera sometimes they have slept come and woken up and if the child has slept even for 20 minutes and woken up they will not go to sleep that time and they will not go to sleep again so that's been one point of concern that we have that the child has had a nap in the car and now they have woken up they are they are fresh now they are not going to go to sleep so that that will be an appointment that has to be rescheduled but otherwise i mean in your case the child has a longer sleeping pattern if the child goes to sleep and doesn't wake for another hour two hours that's great that that looks fine right um thank you so much dr malik i think it was a wonderful session and there are a lot of thank you messages on the chat which i would like to read today we all learned to know about to read the graph thank you for this wonderful session thank you for the amazing section thank you for your patience and compassion i'm, I'm, I'm very uh, thank uh, you so humbled much humbled and thanks that um, you took out time uh, to to go through this and uh, uh, all the very best to you. and if there's anything feel free to uh, to email uh, i can share my email uh, with uh, um, ms deepa and dr seema um, or you can ask the queries to them and they can email me however uh, and uh, all the best thank you thank you so much really really appreciate it thanks thank you everyone bye 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 bye